and combat with your HVAC system. So your two largest energy uh, users in the cultivation are actually competing against each other because the more lighting you have, the light puts off heat, the more HVAC you have to have to overcome that heat load. Um, and they go in lockstep too with energy usage. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard equation to control. Understanding that CO2 supplementation is really necessary to utilize all the light that you are providing. Typically those thousand watt double-ended um, HPS lights that are most common in the flowering rooms, if you have all of those in a, in a really intense lighting canopy, your plants are actually limited by the, the biology of the plant. In order to conduct photosynthesis, how plants take in you know, in energy and actually grow, um, it's light, it's, they take in light and CO2 at a fixed ratio. And if you bring your lighting way up and super intense, the plant actually biologically can absorb and utilize all that light unless you bring up the CO2 level within the room. So that's why we're oftentimes feeding supplemental CO2 within a grow room to help the plants with photosynthesis. But it also ties back to energy because Either you need to turn your lights down to the, the level of CO, ambient CO2 that your plants can actually perform the photosynthesis so you're not wasting all that extra light, or you need to bring in that supplemental CO2 to bring up the efficiency of your plants to be able to actually use the light you're providing. Heat and condensate reuse. There's a lot of heat that's generated within these facilities. Um, there's optimal ways that it can be reused also condensate. There's a lot of humidity that's coming out of these facilities. These plants transpire under those intense lights and all this heat load. Um, and so not only is your HVAC system fighting heat, but it's fighting humidity and you can um, reuse the condensate that's created from that process. Uh, building management systems with environmental controls and, and sensors, that's really going to optimize your cultivation. If you can, you know, um, a one degree temperature difference can have almost a 3% impact on your energy, overall energy usage. So you really want to dial in your environmental controls and keep them within spec. Um, and sensors and automatic systems will really help you do that. So you're not going over and adjusting the thermostat and you know, your humidity controls all manually. It's, it really helps to have an automated system. Fans, this sounds really simple but you don't wanna have microclimates within your grow. You don't wanna have heat spots where the HVAC system isn't circulating well enough. And so this, this group of 10 plants is at 80 degrees where everyone else has a nice 70, you know, 75 degree canopy um, that can be detrimental to your plants. You wanna have a uniform environment. So having fans and good circulation within the room is also really important. Rolling benches and vertical farming. Um, this is all about space utilization. So you're providing that light canopy. Think of your light canopy. You pay for that. For every watt that goes into those lights, you pay for it within your energy bill. So you don't want to have aisle space that's lit by these really intense lights. You want to have a full dense canopy. And so what rolling benches allow you to do is sort of part the seas so you can walk through and create an aisle space work, be able to work on your plants, trim them, feed them, you know, tend to them, make sure that they don't have pests and, you know, signs of um, any mildew or anything like that. And then be able to push the benches back together to fully utilize the, the space within the room instead of having an aisle between each row of plants with wasted light in between. Um, you can really optimize your grow and your production if you've got these rolling benches. Vertical farming is where you're stacking row, you know, like with it when their plants are small, either in clone or in veg, where you have them on racks and you have multiple harvests going upwards. Um, you can really utilize your space and your lighting if you're growing vertically. The key there is your lights heat load. If you're, it's really difficult to do that in a flowering room because those high intense lights, unless you're using LEDs, um, are putting out that heat load and heat travels upwards. And so it's gonna get hotter and hotter the higher you go in your building. And then if you're stacking lights on top of each other, it's, it's gonna be too much. So vertical farming is really more possible in the clone and the veg stage, the plants are smaller and also the lights have a lower heat load to, to overcome in that smaller space. Um, purchasing renewable energy offsets is a lot more obtainable than trying to install renewables at cannabis facilities. It's a, it's a sad truth, but it's twofold problem. First, financing. It's pretty hard to get financing, tax rebates, incentives 
because it's a federally illegal business sector. Usually those are federal rebates, federal tax incentives um, that cannabis isn't eligible for. Sometimes because of that same federal legality, it's hard to get financing um, versus it's very easy to purchase, go and purchase renewable uh, energy offsets to have somebody else generate some renewable energy in place of, uh, you know, kind of offset your energy use. There's also the second issue is it's a really high energy load for a very small size footprint. So we're using a lot of energy, more energy per square foot than most operations. Um, so you're not gonna have enough room on your roof or your parking lot or wherever you're gonna put those solar panels, you're not gonna have enough room to really make a sizable dent um, in, that, in that operation. Sometimes we've seen some successful projects where they just tie some renewable uh, like solar panel panels just directly to the lighting spectrum. And you know, it's only powering the lights and it's not tied to the grid, for instance. That we've seen some smaller projects work. So retrofit by design, as I mentioned, we converted all of these warehouses. Very rarely do we get to do a complete does, you know, by design, um, everything's perfect from the start. We're often taking a iterative approach where I maybe do one or two projects, see some return on my investment, bank that savings, and then use it to purchase, you know, more equipment to keep doing sustainable, uh, you know, upgrades. You don't have to go, for instance, to full LEDs right away. You can start adding them into your light canopy, see how your plants respond, learn, continue to add a little bit more. It doesn't have to be a full retrofit overnight. So keep that in mind. Um, the, the high uh, cooling and dehumidification that's associated with those traditional high pressure sodium lights because of the heat load, keep that in mind. LEDs, if you're going to retrofit to LEDs, keep in mind the impact that's gonna have on your HVAC system, especially here in Colorado. So if you had a facility where you installed, you know, these really high heat load HPS lights, and now you want to convert to LEDs, you have to think about, does my HVAC system have heat? Typically, it's running air conditioning 24 hours a day to overcome the heat load of the lights. Even in the wintertime when it's freezing here and there's snow on the ground, they're still running AC units at these facilities. Now, if you eliminate that heat source of those lights and you convert to LEDs, which have a much lower heat profile associated with them, you might need to install a heat in your building <laughs> because you're, it, it might actually get that cold and make that big of a difference. So you need to be thinking ahead of time, what does this, it, this upgrade have an impact on my system holistically? And do I need to make simultaneous upgrades? Um, if I convert to all LED lights right before the winter time and I get a freeze, it's going to be bad if I didn't think ahead that maybe I need to add some supplemental heat. Remembering that CO2 increases lighting needs. So if you're bringing up the level of CO2, make sure you're meeting it to your plant needs with your, with your lighting. You can use PPFD meters to even get down to like how many photons or light is landing on my plant. Um, and then looking at my plant, how much CO2 do I need in order to be able to use all that PPFD of light. Um, Existing HVAC for human comfort versus agriculture. I touched on that already. Um, why Rex renewable energy credits are more realistic than renewables and rolling benches. We covered that too. So just to give you um, a picture, a snapshot example of a lighting conversion going from those high pressure traditional lights to LEDs, um, a, you know, over a five year period. Keep in mind that LEDs are still adapting to indoor agriculture. They're, the technology has come a long way. The reason why LEDs were not widely used sort of from the start, maybe five, 10 years ago when we first legalized, is they didn't have the color spectrum, the lighting spectrum that was necessary to really grow these plants indoors. That technology has come a long way. Um, I still know a lot of cultivators who don't fully trust the LED light spectrum. So when they're cultivations, they'll still have some HPS lighting for supplemental, and then it's primarily LED so that they get that full lighting spectrum and color spectrum that they, they, they really want. Um, but as you can see, looking at these numbers, it's over time, you know, the upfront cost of LED installation is a lot higher 
but then your energy is a lot lower and your maintenance over time is a lot lower. These LEDs last a lot longer as well. So it can be, you know, over a five-year period in this project in particular, it was about $130,000 savings. It also has um, environmental impacts too. If we're saving energy, we are not having that power plant generate that energy. It's equivalent to, you know, taking about 38 cars um, off the road per year in this specific case. All right, so that was energy and that's the primary impact. Uh, we'll cover a couple of waste streams and talk a little bit more about water. And then I'll give you guys some specific examples of some successful sustainability projects. So plant waste is a primary waste stream from cultivation operations. It makes sense. We're in the business of growing plants. We're going to have a lot of plant waste. Really, the cannabinoids of value, the THC, the CBD, um, you know, all, all the other different cannabinoids uh, that are in the plants are primarily concentrated in the top leaves and certainly in the flowers. The stalks, the stems, the fan leaves, the root balls, those are all plant waste streams. Um, and oftentimes the grow media can be wasted after every harvest too. Typically rock wool is not reused. Um, some, some folks don't even reuse soil. They'll throw out their all of their soil at the end of every harvest and bring in new soil. That's, that's not something we recommend. We, we certainly would like to see grow media be reused. Um, but the, the best solution for plant waste and managing it is don't send it to the landfill, uh, compost it or put in it, you know, send it to an anaerobic digester. There's lots of nutrient value that can be recovered from that plant material. And then also if you're sending it to an anaerobic digester, you are eliminating air emissions as well, because as plants break down, they release CO2, they release methane. Those are greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. They naturally emit those as they compost and break down. If we put that process in an anaerobic digester, which is basically just a box um, that you're composting within, and then we can capture those air emissions coming off of it. We can use methane as fuel. We can use CO2 for supplemental CO2 generation. We can create this closed loop system if we're really mindful about how we're doing that. Here's where regulations can be a barrier to sustainability. Um, a lot of states, Michigan, Illinois, Massachusetts, I believe, um, a lot of them still have this requirement that all marijuana waste has to be mixed with 50% non-marijuana waste before leaving the licensed facility. The goal of that regulation was safety, security, no illicit diversion. Basically, they didn't want dumpster divers coming in and taking this and selling it as product or you know, exposing people to what, what's essentially trash. Um, when they wrote that regulation, they didn't think this meant or that was going to have the consequence. They didn't even have the foresight to say, this is doubling our landfill footprint and essentially mandating landfilling because it's really hard to come up with 50% organic waste to meet your plant waste stream. So here in Colorado, just January 1st of this year, we just changed that 50-50 waste mate rule. And we made an exemption that said all the low THC components of the plant, the stalks, the stems, the fan leaves, the root balls, the grow media, you can compost that uh, directly without having to do 50-50 mixing or any grinding um, just by action of composting alone, you're meeting all those requirements. So that's, that's a big win. Make sure that you're uh, disposing of solvent contaminated waste properly. That requirement varies from state to state very, very much so. Um, essentially, California sees solvent contaminated plant waste as hazardous waste. Here in Colorado, we um, did a lot of testing on it and really we established that the amount of solvent in that plant waste post extraction is typically so low unless it's like dripping wet that it doesn't make a, a large difference and it can still be composted. Um, stocks and stems are great for industrial fiber recovery. This is a growing market that I hope to see come um, into fruition a little bit more from both marijuana and hemp. Just the cannabis plant in general, it has really strong, long fibers that are great for um, everything from hempcrete to clothing to paper. I mean, this is a really good uh, and renewable fiber, source of fibers. So I hope to see, you know, we're already generating these fibers from these industries. I, I'm, I'm excited to see some back-end manufacturing come out of it. Um, you know, one day I'm going to have a home made out of hempcrete. <laughs> um, 